and uh, I'm very happy to be here. I guess I'll speak Ukrainian mostly because, uh, as I understand, most of the people, uh, at least now, are Ukrainians. Good afternoon. Today we are going to talk about uh, not only cats and dogs, the companion animals who we see quite often, but also we shall be talking about farming animals and what our organization is doing and how our activities have changed because of the war. I would like to ask whether we, you see my presentation. We shall be talking about factory farming in wartime, the wise in the house. I am a coordinator at the Open Cages organization. I have been working in the organization for about one year. Before this, I was just a volunteer of this organization. Therefore, this is part of my life, this is my family, this is the hobby that was uh, actually turned into a job, this is my passion. So, uh, I will give you a couple of words about our organization, uh, why uh, farming animals, what farming animals and what do we mean when we are talking about providing assistance to this group of animals. Open Cages Ukraine is a uh, part of the Animal Focus Organization Animal International. Now it includes uh, six countries and the right number of goals we are trying to achieve. So we have a number of joint campaigns, uh, joint for the majority of countries. We have a number of problems and challenges which are common to all of us, but also there are certain specific things which are present, unfortunately, only in Ukraine. For example, I'm talking about uh, keeping uh, chickens and hens in uh, special cages. This is exclusively our pain and our challenge. So what is the goal of our organization? Our aim is to reduce the suffering of farming animals owing to systematic changes in society and business and law. I will explain what we mean here. So if we are talking about changes in society, we would like more and more people to understand that, first of all, farming animals feel pain in the same way as the companion animals. We have been talking about it. We have been explaining it. We are talking about biology issues, psychological issues, emotions of uh, farming animals. We are talking about the positive uh, emotions they are capable of. We are talking about their communities. We are talking about their families. We are talking about how um, they can love, how they can sympathize. The more people will be aware of this, the more uh, compassion and empathy we shall get from society, and we do need this human support. We are also talking about changes in business activities, and here there are two main directions. The first one is uh, changes in uh, keeping conditions. Uh, it's not only about legislation. For example, the farm itself can improve can its own conditions for them to meet the European ones or for it to become more attractive for consumers or for investors, for example. For example, they can state that the animals are kept in better conditions than in other farms. Also, we are talking about uh, uh, supporting uh, plant businesses, for example, uh, producing replacement for uh, meat. We are talking about plant milk, plant animals, and we actually would like these businesses to get more investments, to get more attention. We want more consumers to, to taste these products, and we want them to become popular, just not because people buy them, uh, because they sympathize with animals, but also because they are 
very tasty. And there is also another direction. This is the legislation activities. And uh, very often, just by adopting this or that law, we can influence the whole industry. We can improve the lives of millions of animals kept in such farms. And actually, it was the case last year when the law was adopted. And I know that lots of Ukrainian uh, animal activists know about it and one of the novelties of this law was the ban on foie gras production in ukraine this is a ban on forced feeding it is considered to be particularly cruel method and as a result foie gras became beyond the law so we could actually uh, be protesting about a certain product or practice, but when is something when something is banned according to the law, it actually simplifies our activities. So legislation and changes in the legislation is something which is really important. So these are three areas, three directions of our activities where we shall try to achieve some progress. And second. So when we design our programs, we try to base them on effective altruism approach, which is widespread in many European and American countries. In Ukraine, it is less known. Therefore, I would like to tell you more how we measure efficiency of our activities and why is it important. So briefly, this initiative is aimed at helping people do something good or some altruistic actions and do it better and in a more efficient way. I think that lots of people are ready to donate some of uh, their savings uh, or time in order to make this world better. But very often, we, when we choose what we are going to do, we try to understand what is better. But when we uh, think about charities, we are more guided by our uh, emotions. And effective altruism as a movement actually is aimed at those things we choose. And therefore, there is the whole philosophy behind this movement. It is sort of a guideline for us to be able to choose the most efficient methods and at the same time will be pleasant uh, and nice and easy for us. So first of all, according to effective altruism, it's necessary to uh, value human and financial resources. So it's not only about protection, uh, we are talking about different kinds of problems. So what should be the criteria? It should be something very important. Something that influences lots of lives, uh, and not only people, but the lives of all. It's something that uh, is uh, actually neglected by society and something which is measurable or tractable so while we can measure our success and state okay we have achieved some changes so we are not talking about uh, the protection but we're talking about general challenges and among the issues of effective altruism uh, there are the following ones pandemics and we still remember, right, the COVID uh, period, and we understood that the attempts to predict the pandemic and to prevent it uh, are really important. Another issue is providing basic medical supplies in poor countries, because just with the help of one or two dollars, we'll be able to save lives. Another 
thing is improving decision making. In particular, uh, trying to predict what changes happen in society owing to AI, owing to analytical research. For example, one of the systems was able to predict the war in Ukraine uh, actually several days before, and the uh, accuracy rate was up more than 90%. So the more people will be aware of the fact that these systems are exact, uh, do exist, the better the data will be used. And another issue for effective altruism is ending factory farming. Factory farming is about billions of animals. And this is something which is close to us. These animals are suffering close to us. Actually, this is the issue which is neglected by society. And I'll give you some statistics that prove it. We definitely can stop it. We know that life without killing animals just for the sake of uh, getting some food is possible. We see that the number of uh, farming animals is reduced, and we see that owing to our efforts, their conditions are better. So why is factory farming the issue? All over the world, there are about 31 billion land animals, and I'm talking about factory farming only. That means there are, there are approximately four factory farming animals being kept in such farms. Uh, fish is uh, counted in kilograms, therefore I cannot give you exact figures. There are fluctuations, but let's say from let, let, let's say about there are 100 billion of fish that are also suffering and are kept in factory farming. So this is the global issue. And how is it addressed by society? We have some American data. I'm not sure that uh, any other country will be very much different. In America, uh, in 2018, there were about 10 million, 10 billion animals, and there were only 7 million animals in shelters. So, what is in blue is actually the uh, farming animals, and 7 million are companion animals. But if we have a look at funding, the situation will be just the opposite. Farming animals and assistance to improve their conditions and their rescue. So for them, about $100 million are spent on U.S. farm animal advocacy, while companion animals get about $5 billion a year. So we see how disproportionate sums are I'm talking about the money spent on the animal uh, that is suffering, irrespective of the fact whether we are talking about companion or farming animals. Information about Ukraine. In Ukraine, we have about uh, a bit more than 261 million farmed animals, and the majority of them are broiler chickens. So we are talking about either prolly chickens or cage laying eggs. Uh, there are uh, about one animal, uh, one million animals raised for fur and 35 million farmed fish. And we see that the hens are suffering the most. They are kept in uh, industrial cages. And we pay attention to this, we paid attention before the war, we pay attention right now. So what is in the focus of our attention? So what did we do before the war? Uh, Plant-based nutrition. 
we were talking about land-based campaigns or vegan campaigns. They were aimed at popularization of plant nutrition, supporting businesses, uh, developing a replacement for meat. We just tell why it is good, why is it useful and healthy. We cooperate with the restaurants and we try to create the world where we have more plant-based products. Another area of our activity is ban the production of fur. We uh, made a video of like, drug traffic, uh, how the animals in fur farms live. And we have shown not only the sufferings of uh, animals, but also sufferings of both workers at such farms and people who live around such farms, because the villages uh, that are situated nearby uh, suffer from pollution of land, air, water. This is actually uh, small environmental disasters. So, I suppose in, in for, we were informed by people who live nearby such uh, farms. This is cage free campaign. This is fighting, fighting these uh, farming farms where the hens are kept in very small cages. And another area of our activity is legal advocacy. We are talking not only about farming animals, but we are ready to support any draft uh, laws that improve the lives of all the animals in Ukraine, be these farmed animals or companion animals or wild animals. So we are ready to support everything that is aimed at improving their lives, ban on circus animals or any other cases. So this is what we were doing before the war. But when, on the 24th of February, we woke up, we understood that probably we would have to step away from our uh, routine activities. We won't be able to popularize plant-based products, at least right now. And our first goal was to ensure safety for our volunteers because human resources is the most important and the safety of our volunteers was our priority at that time. And in the left picture, you could see how we can, how we help our volunteers to move. Our Polish colleagues helped all those who wanted to leave Ukraine uh, or who wanted to go to abroad. So we were providing logistics support, financial support. We understood that people were on the priority of our agenda. We had to save their lives, their psychological and physical well-being. Also, at the beginning of war, it was actually impossible for us to work with legislation and business. Therefore, we were trying to be useful where we could. Here you see uh, evacuation of 39 heads from Kharkiv. This is the mini shelter that was evacuated from Kharkiv to Lviv and then from uh, Lviv to Poland. We also were distributing the humanitarian aid. We brought uh, animals from Ukraine to, to other countries. So we understood that so far we cannot uh, ensure any systematic changes. Systemic changes, so we had to do uh, something that can be done here and now. But uh, later we understood that situation was, uh, well, relevantly uh, well, to some extent stable, and we came back to the issue of farmed animals. So we were trying to understand what kind of damages uh, were in the industry uh, due to this invasion. We launched the survey, which was done by our uh, 
activists. We came into contact with 300 farms. We got the information about damages at these uh, farms, and we were trying to understand how many animals uh, suffered, whether the animals generally managed to survive in the occupied territories and in the liberated territories. So what kind of information we obtained? Everything was quite obvious. The, the, the biggest amount of damage was in the territories that were occupied, uh, and it's very difficult to contact those territories which uh, are uh, occupied, so you either do not have data or cannot come into contact with us. The general picture is like that. The longer the territory was occupied or under shelling, the more damages it suffered. Generally, Ukraine has lost about 15% of its uh, farms, and that means that about 15% of Ukrainian livestock died. The biggest case was death of 4 million chickens at the largest poultry farm in Chernobyevka. Chernobyevka is famous for very successful Ukrainian uh, armed forces activities, but also for this tragic case. And the animals died not because of uh, shellings, but just because uh, there was no electricity. Uh, the electricity was cut off by the Russian army, so they didn't have cooling system, heating system, there was no water supply, and that's why this hands died. And the same story was witnessed in many other farms where people could not get there in order to provide food to these hands. There were direct uh, rocket missiles, missile strikes in the farms. So we have, we're talking about hundreds of millions of uh, animals who are now found dead. We're talking about pigs, cows, hens, sheep. So practically all the, all the species uh, suffered. Definitely the companion animals were also suffering as well as wild animals kept in national uh, parks. But because the farming animals are the biggest in terms of numbers, we can talk about the scale of their suffering. And now we see uh, how such cases as electricity cut off, lack of water supply, uh, impossibility to get there results in the death of thousands and millions of animals just in one farm. And it's not only about the war. There were cases uh, of the pandemic, for example, in the past, and when the pandemic started in this or that farm, nobody was uh, going to treat them. They were just killed. This is very similar to genocide. But we understand that 15% uh, have been uh, have died, while 85% are living in those areas that have not been touched by war, and they are kept in the same conditions which were before. Uh, and in Ukraine, almost 100% of laying hands are kept in battery cages. This practice is banned in Europe, and this practice should have been banned in Ukraine since 2026. When, uh, actually, when we signed the association agreement, Ukraine uh, took on the obligation to get rid of these battery cages where it is impossible to spread one, one swing, where you uh, can only uh, stand on uh, this uh, platform. So the, 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 the animal is suffering throughout all its life while it is hatching eggs. Definitely the life is shorter than in nature, so the moment it stops hatching eggs, it is utilized. 
And uh, this issue of battery cages is actually the most topical one for us right now, because we really are concerned that probably the regulations uh, will be reduced. I'm talking about the Ukrainian authorities right now. But there are also positive uh, things. For example, there is a case that one Ukrainian farmer who was growing um, uh, shrimps and uh, when the Russian forces came closer, he understood that well, probably he should not do it, and he transformed uh, his farm into plant farm for the community living in the region to be able to get uh, basic food products, particularly taking into account our losses in Kherson and in northern regions of Ukraine. So he understood that it will be more useful for society. So this is a, an example of good story where we understand that plant-based farming is more stable than animal-based farming. Some other positive things. Ukraine has been granted the EU candidate status and that means we shall get some funding, some investments for uh, developing business and regarding what business will be developed, animal-based or plant-based, depends on the attitude of the society. So we are going to work with the businesses that would like to enter the Ukrainian market. And we would like to ensure that the investments are, uh, go into uh, more stable and plant-based initiatives. Therefore, we cooperate with the Euro Group for Animals organization, and it assists the other organizations in many European countries. I'm talking about 40 different organizations. So it helps these organizations comply with the European standards and it helps the countries adopt these new norms. And probably the candidate uh, status and our potential entering the European Union will become a good reason for the majority of farms to uh, start uh, dealing more with plant-based products. Uh, some less global activities, supporting uh, shelters uh, with farming animals. We uh, brought some goods there and we launched a fundraising campaign. Unfortunately, this uh, shelter gets more and more animals. The prices are growing. Some of the shelters are in the occupied territories. Therefore, these shelters now are in need of uh, assistance and attention. Here you see the uh, food we brought, and here you see that they are trying to save the calves. Another area of our activity is information campaigns and creating materials about farmed animals, how they feel, why, uh, why we have to uh, focus more on plants. We try to explain the problems uh, at the farms. Uh, it is different from keeping animals, uh, for example, in the village. And we try to explain why we should get rid of these practices. And another part of our activities, which I have already mentioned, is our plant-based campaign. And we try to support vegan brands, plant uh, brands that produce uh, substitutes for meat products. We try to uh, support uh, Lviv Vegan Kitchen, uh, 
it sends plant-based uh, uh, stuff to our uh, armed forces in order to support the vegans in the military. But this will be a separate topic as it will be delivered tomorrow at one o'clock. But my colleague, Alevdina Kozachok, will be talking about introducing vegan food supplies in the army. So I encourage you to listen to her report as well. Thank you for uh, listening to me. I'm ready to answer your questions. 